just prayed a rosary, but let's say another prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Pray the Memorare. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Thanks for coming out. This morning, as some of you may have seen, my talk, I entitled it, Growing in Grace with Jesus and Mary. And the talk is, has two parts. The first part is to talk about Mary. The second part is to talk about how we grow in grace, the sort of dynamics of growth in grace. And to begin, I want to maybe apologize, because I know last month, Father Hazing also spoke about, spoke about Our Lady. But St. Bernard has a famous axiom that says, De Mariam Numquam Satis, of Mary, there's never enough. So we're going to keep talking about Our Lady because this month is also the month of May, which is Our Lady's month. And not only that, but as some of you, most of you perhaps know, last weekend there was a particularly special occasion in honor of Our Lady. It was the 100th anniversary of the apparitions of Our Lady of Fatima in Portugal. And so I want to begin actually talking about Fatima. Now one disclaimer, or perhaps note, is that I did not grow up, or even until kind of this year, have a great devotion to Our Lady of Fatima. I've always been kind of a Francophile, and I like Our Lady of Lourdes, I like Our Lady of the Miraculous Medal, who we have here in our chapel, but as this anniversary of Fatima was coming up, I thought, I need to know more about this. And just to think, if Fatima's not your thing, that's okay. None of these apparitions of Our Lady, whichever ones we may like, are de fide. None of them are absolutely required for salvation, but they're gifts that Jesus and Mary give to the church to inspire us and to help us to grow. And the apparitions in Fatima are no doubt of that kind. They happened 100 years ago in that little field outside of the city of Fatima to these three children, two of whom were canonized just this past weekend. And these three children, Lucia, Jacinta, and Francisco, were there praying. And for a few months before Our Lady appeared, they had already had some extraordinary occurrences. Angels began appearing to them, the, the guardian angel of Portugal. I think it's a cool thing because most of us think I have my own guardian angel, but also there are guardian angels for institutions like countries. So there's a guardian angel of America. He has a lot of work to do. But you know, there's all these different guardian angels and they appeared and they began to invite the children sort of, as it were, even preparing them for the message of what Our Lady was going to ask them to do. And the message was to love God and to do penance for sinners, to pray. And when Mary first appeared to the children, and the first time she did appear was on the 13th of May, 1917, what was her message? She had a few things that she asked of the children. She began to ask them to pray the rosary daily for peace in the world. It's 1917 when this happened, in the midst of the Great War, and so much turbulence and trial and war existed in the world. And so she asked them to pray the rosary daily. She invited them to renew, to call, or she asked them to offer themselves to God and to bear the sufferings that come into their lives in reparation for sins and for the conversion of sinners. She said to them, these are the words of Our Lady, are you willing to offer yourselves to God and to bear all sufferings he wills to send you as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended and of supplication for the conversion of sinners? Are you willing to offer yourself? That I think is maybe the greatest summary it's in one little phrase of what Our Lady's asking of Fatima. She's inviting these children to offer their whole lives to God as an act of penance, as an act of prayer, so that the world may be converted. And then she told them after this first meeting to come back, to come back for the next five months to that same spot and that she would appear to them, which they did. And just going quickly through sort of what other things happened in those coming five months, in June, when they were there on the 13th of June, again, Mary encouraged them to pray the rosary daily. 
and she began to reveal the devotion to the Immaculate Heart, the centrality of loving the heart of Mary. It's a devotion that already existed in the church. Our Lady of Fatima didn't invent that, but it was something that she definitely accentuated and encouraged them to take on. She said, I promise salvation to those who embrace my Immaculate Heart, and those souls will be loved by God like flowers placed by me to adorn his throne. That those who love the heart of Mary are like flowers before the throne of God, offering beautiful scent, you know, before that throne. In, Ju- in July, it was perhaps the most tumultuous or kind of scary of the visions. The pictures of the two new saints um, have them looking kind of dour. They're based on a picture. And I think if I had had this vision, I probably would be a little dour as well. Because what happened was, Mary appeared, and light came forth from her hands, and it set, it seemed to set the world around them on fire, and they had a vision of hell. And they saw what hell looked like. And seeing that, Mary said, this is the reality, that many people are falling into hell. And to save people from that destiny, you need to be devoted to the Immaculate Heart. And she foretells and, and talks about that there's going to be an even greater war that comes in the future. She foretold the coming of communism in Russia and the great trial and slaughter that's going to happen in the 20th century, the persecution of the church. But she says that my Immaculate Heart will triumph, that I will triumph through the prayers and the penances that the people devoted to me will do. And it was in this vision in July that she gave them the Fatima prayer that we pray in the rosary. We just were praying, Oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. This is when Mary revealed that. I must admit, for a long time I was praying that prayer and didn't know it was from Fatima. You know, but that's one of the things, and it's incredible how this devotion has shaped the world. Catholics around the world all pray that prayer. And again, it's coupled with the reality that hell's real. And it's something that we should ourselves seek to avoid, but also praying for others. We can help them to arrive not in hell, but in heaven. In August of the year after July, the children had begun to become fairly notorious in a good way. Many people knew about them, but the officials were kind of skeptical. So on the 13th of August, they were in jail. They were arrested and sort of prevented from going there on the 13th of August. But Mary knew where they were, and so she didn't go there then. But once they got out on the 19th of August, she appeared to them again. And she said, I want you to build a chapel here, like Mary so often does to Juan Diego and Guadalupe, to Bernadette at Lourdes, so also to the children in Fatima. She wanted it to become a place of pilgrimage, to build a chapel there. And from the scenes of Pope Francis's visit this past Saturday, we see the beautiful church that was built in Fatima at the request of Our Lady. And what did she say? And that day in August, the 19th of August, she said, pray, pray very much and make sacrifices for sinners. For many souls go to hell because there are none to sacrifice themselves and to pray for them. Again, she repeats, she's very consistent in her message all this time, to pray, to do penance for ourselves and also for others, to make sacrifices for sinners. In September, on the 13th, she didn't really give them any new message, but she just told them, in October will be my last visit, and invite people to come. This is going to be my last one, and I will manifest the truth of what's going on here. And so then, when it comes to October, in the 13th of October, 1917, there were 70,000 people who showed up in this field out in the countryside in Fatima, all there, waiting to see what's going to happen. And there was a vision. The children saw several things in the sky. She, they saw Mary again, saying, I am Our Lady of the Rosary. Pray the Rosary daily. Again, reiterating the importance of praying the Rosary for the conversion of sinners, for the conversion and peace in the world. Then there was a vision of St. Joseph with Jesus. And scholars of Fatima think it's a sign of the joyful mysteries, this revelation of the joyful mysteries of Jesus, Mary, Joseph living together in the early years of Jesus' life. Then there was an image of Our Lady of Sorrows depicting Mary at the foot of the cross. And this is the sorrowful mysteries. Finally, a revelation of the, joy, of the glorious mysteries. They saw Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Mary enthroned in heaven at the heights of, of this mountain, which always represents sort of the place where God dwells. Our Lady of Mount Carmel re- revealed the glorious mysteries. 
And then, after these visions, confirming sort of the importance of the rosary, the different mysteries of the rosary, then the extraordinary miracle happened. 70,000 people saw the sun dance in the sky, which would have been terrifying. But it's true, and there were atheists who went out, atheist journalists who wrote, we all saw it. We all saw this extraordinary thing happen. Many people were converted through the extraordinary sign that Mary gave to confirm the visions. This seeing the sun actually dance and move in the sky. After that, no other visions. It ended. It concluded. But Mary gave so much in that short time. There was one vision that came to Lucia, the one who survived. The other two children, uh, Francisco and Jacinta, both died very young. And so they were canonized, you know, these young children saints. But Lucia lived into old age, and a few years afterward, in 1925, she was in a convent where she had entered, and she received one other vision. And it was Our Lady asked her to connect to all the rest of the doctrine that she taught, the, the devotion of the first Saturdays. That uh, Our Lady said this. She said, have compassion on the heart of your most holy mother, covered with thorns, which ungrateful, with which ungrateful men pierce it at every moment. There is no one to make an act of reparation to remove them. Look, my daughter, at my heart, surrounded with, with thorns. You at least try to console me and denounce in my name that I promise to assist at the moment of death with all the graces necessary for salvation, all those who on the first Saturday of five consecutive months shall receive the sacrament of confession, receive Holy Communion, recite five decades of the rosary, and keep me company for 15 minutes while meditating on the 15 mysteries of the rosary with the intention of making reparation to my Immaculate Heart. So this five Saturdays of devotion, as it were, is a concrete way in which Mary said, this is what I want you to do. This prayer, this penance, conversion, to do it on the first five Saturdays. And so just like we have first Fridays, we have the first Saturday devotion to the Immaculate Heart. I always notice an uptick in confessions on the first Saturday because there are many devout souls who do this every month. You know, for many years they've been doing the first Saturday devotion. And it's a way, to, again, to make reparation to Our Lady to listen and heed the call of Mary. Again, it's not necessary salvation. It's not absolutely required. You're going to go to hell if you don't do the first Saturday devotion. But it's a way to manifest our love and our desire to console the heart of Mary. So that's the essence, as it were, of Our Lady Fatima. Just so you know, in case you've never heard before. Again, I didn't know much about it until recently. But at the heart of what it's talking about, if we had to summarize the heart of this revelation, this private revelation of Mary to the children of Fatima, it comes down to two things. Prayer, especially praying the rosary, and penance. And the two of these things are the two pillars of the Christian life in many ways. That these two practices summarize Mary's doctrine. And again, they go back to Jesus. They're not anything new, but Mary's encouraging us, reminding us, showing us the importance of us being people of prayer, that we take time to pray every day, and to do penances. The collect at Mass this past Sunday for the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima honed in on these two things. This is the prayer the Church gives for the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima. It says, O oh God, who chose the mother of your Son to be our mother also, grant us that, persevering in penance and prayer for the salvation of the world, we may further more effectively each day the reign of Christ. So it says it, the church even summarized it there, persevering in prayer and penance for the salvation of the world. That is what is at the heart of Fatima. And I think maybe, I hope you've all heard this before, you should pray and do penance. You're like, this isn't very original, Father. I could have done something else this morning. But it's good for us to hear it again. But I want to talk about, in this second half of the talk, so this is the message that Mary has given us. This is, as it were, the path that she's given us for how to grow in holiness. But I want to talk about now exactly how does that even work? What does it mean? What do we, how do we understand the efficacy of doing prayer and penance? And the key in my mind to understanding why our prayers, why our penances are worthwhile, they make sense, is the doctrine of merit. The doctrine of merit, M-E-R-I-T, is not something that's often talked about. But 
it's something that really, for me, unlocks and un- makes me understand better and, and help to have a reason for, okay, why, you know, Jesus, I'm, I'm praying, I'm doing penance, I'm not necessarily feeling the effects, it's not necessarily a, an emotional or a, you know, sensible change that's happening, but this truth of the Catholic faith helps us to understand that, no, when we pray, when we do penance, it does, because God promises, it does great work. And on the one hand, when we think about merit, it's a simple doctrine. It's something we understand on a natural level. When you do a good work, you receive a reward. Any of you who have jobs understand this idea. You go to work, you do your job, and then you get paid a salary. You merit your salary. It's the simple concept. But this is true on a supernatural level as well. When we do good works, God rewards us. Not necessarily with money. Though, I guess he could if he wanted to, but something even greater than money is what God gives us when we pray and we do penance. He gives us an increase in grace. We receive more grace when we do good works. And this is not something the church found out. You know, some of you, perhaps if any of you are converts from Protestantism, you may think, oh no, this is why the Protestants don't like Catholics, because we're meriting our salvation. Good works are somehow saving us. But this is a truth that Jesus talks about in the Gospels, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the very Beatitudes. Jesus says, rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. In Matthew 25, the famous parable of the separation of the sheep and the goats, Jesus says, you will be rewarded on how you love these least ones, on how you lived, what your actions were, will determine if you go with the sheep or with the goats. So Jesus himself talks about the sense of living a Christian life is the foundation, doing good works is a foundation of do you go to heaven or hell? It's at the heart of it, growing in grace in this way, that we will receive a reward. Even St. Paul, who is, you know, the place where our Protestant brothers and sisters go to talk about the gratuity of salvation, that we're saved by grace, not by works, they want to say. But even St. Paul talks about this reality of we receive a reward for our actions. He says in his second letter to Timothy, he says that you will receive a crown of righteousness that will be given to you by the just judge, the Lord, who will crown your merits. St. Paul also says that God will repay everyone according to his works in Romans chapter 2, and that each will receive his own reward in proportion to his labor in Corinthians. Paul talks about this image, that you do works and you receive a reward. In the early fathers of the church, after the apostolic age, this doctrine is present as well. We hear them, you know, the fathers of the church are those first centuries, those who are taking revelation and applying it to Christian life and exhorting their people to appropriate the gospel. We hear them talking about this dynamic of merit, that doing prayer, doing penance, accepting the cross is going to win them a reward, an increase of grace. St. Ignatius of Antioch, who was a bishop in the early church, who died around the year 117. He was eaten by lions in the Colosseum in Rome, so not very nice, but he's great. his letters are a great gift. He says, let your works be your deposits so that you may receive the sum that is due to you. Again, this very clear talk about doing good works, building something up, putting these deposits down. Also, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, who is the fourth century bishop of Jerusalem, talks about that in, when we get into the afterlife, that every laborer is ready to endure the toils if he sees their reward and prospect. That when we think about heaven and the reward that Jesus will give us through our good works, having grown in grace, praying, doing penance, we'll receive a reward that motivates us even to realize that our good works bring about their own reward. All of this, to quote all those scripture passages, the point is, it's not made up. It's real, this doctrine of merit. But what is it as its heart? How do we understand this? The point is that, and this is what Our Lady at Fatima and over the centuries has constantly said, is that those who love Jesus, when they do any good work, a prayer, a penance, that is pleasing to God, and it can merit for them or for other people an increase of grace. That any action done by a Christian or done by someone in the state of grace who has that supernatural life in them is empowered to then merit subsequent graces. So the thing is, salvation is not something that we're meriting in this sense, 
but it is something because the first grace of conversion, of being brought into the life of grace in the church, is something no one can merit. That's a free gift from God. It's given normally in baptism. When a person is brought into this new kind of life, supernatural life, into the state of grace, friendship with God. But once you're in that, Jesus, St. Paul talks about it as a, you're a new creation. That you now have a new nature out of which you can act. And so as long as we are in the state of grace, as long as we have sanctifying grace in our souls, everything we do in the state of grace can become meritorious. So all of our prayers, when we pray for ourselves, when we pray for others, out of love of God, this is meritorious. There's a beautiful line in the new preface for the Feast of Saints, and actually the whole new translation of the Mass has the word merit in it a lot. It's one of my favorite things about the new translation. It talks about meriting all the time. But in the preface for saints, it says, in crowning your merits, our merits, you crown your own gifts. That ultimately it's because God first gives us this gift that he makes us his cooperators and instruments in helping the world to be saved. So all of the things that we do in a state of grace are going to become effective for our own sanctification. That when I pray out of love, I merit increase in grace. And so there's a certain sense, you know, we don't want to become too sort of, you know, economical in the sense of I put in my my 15 minutes of prayer and I get you know this output because it's we don't want to quantify it but there is a dynamic that when we put the time in even if we don't feel it God gives us grace that is the promise of being a friend of God is that God sees it and even if I don't experience it on a sort of psychological level it's a reality that's going on both for myself and for other people so when we do things when we accept things out of love they bear fruit. This is why St. Paul, that famous passage in Corinthians 13, that's read at every wedding, right? You know, love is patient, love is kind. At the end of that, St. Paul gets very theological. He says, if I, you know, do all these things, if I speak in tongues, if I do, you know, all these sort of prophetic things, if I do them without love, I am nothing. And what is he talking about? It means, because to have sanctifying grace means to have the, the virtue of charity, which is infused in our souls by God. And then we can do things in grace. But if we're not in a state of grace, that means we don't have supernatural charity and we're nothing on a supernatural level, that we lack the principle of these meritorious acts. And this is why those of us who live in a state of grace, and hopefully we do, if we don't, we go to confession and we get back there. But when we are, once we've received this gift of living in God's friendship, having charity poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, our lives become a spiritual powerhouse, both for the increase of grace for ourselves and for the salvation of the whole world. The fundamental message of Fatima is that. Mary's telling these three pious children, you, you young children who are innocent, who are in a state of grace, pray, do penance, offer up your daily trials for the sake of your own sanctification but also for the sanctification of others. That not only can we merit for ourselves an increase of grace, but when we pray, when we do penance for other people, even people who are not in the state of grace, we can help merit for them to get to the state of grace, to get to friendship with God. Now again, that is less sort of injustice. When we do something for ourselves, God is going to guarantee us that he's gonna give us that. It doesn't work immediately because when we're trying to pray for the conversion of someone else, their freedom is operative. God can't force another person to be converted. But we can merit for them the graces that will lead them there. So if any of you know someone who has fallen away from the church, which all of us do, we can pray and do penance for that person. And again, it's not magic. It's not going to automatically make them next week start going back to church and saying the rosary. But it is effective. And this is a promise that Jesus gives us. That it's a promise that Our Lady made at Fatima, is that when we pray, especially pray the rosary, when we do penances, you know, fasting on Fridays, that's something the church asks us to do, not just during Lent, but all year round, to do at least some sort of self-negation or extra prayers on all Fridays. Or to just accept the trials of our day-to-day life, you know, some of you may have, may have had to sit in traffic on the way here this morning. 
that can be something you can offer up for the salvation of your neighbor. Again, any inconvenience. Again, you really can become, if we have this truth in our minds, we can realize and start to see so much power in the day-to-day life that we live. All of the trials, every single one of them, everything we do, can become a source of both increase of grace for ourselves and the salvation of the whole world. All of these little things can become a source of this. In the back of church, um, I put out some holy cards, one with the Sacred Heart of Jesus on the front and one with an image of Our Lady of Fatima. The one with the Sacred Heart of Jesus has the morning offering on it. And I think this is maybe the most concrete way, if you don't pray the morning offering already, to begin trying to even have this mentality that I want to offer up the prayers, works, joys, and sufferings of this day in union with the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass offered throughout the world for the conversion of sinners, reparation for sins, and an increase of grace. Basically, that prayer is, again, all, what we're doing, it's not because we're awesome and I can do this, but it's because first God has empowered us to be his cooperators, that God has given us the gift of sanctifying grace, which then makes us able to act in a godly way. And so this is the glory of divine grace to receive it. St. Thomas Aquinas, and maybe my favorite part of his Summa, which I like a great deal, but his one point where he talks about the reality of sanctifying grace. He says, the reality of grace, of sanctifying habitual grace in one soul is more valuable than the entire created universe because it's something that gives us a participation in the life of God. So the whole solar system, the whole universe expanding out there is worth less, is less impressive than the reality of sanctifying grace in our souls. And the reason for that is because it's through grace that we are able to be friends with God. It's the grace that Jesus merited for us on the cross, that's poured into our souls of baptism, continues to increase any time we receive Holy Communion, and that continues to increase when we pray in do penance. That is so valuable. And so we should love and seek and give thanks for the grace that God has freely bestowed upon us, but then we also must take advantage of it, as it were, and put it to work. And through a life of prayer, of faithful prayer every day, especially praying the rosary and penance, Penances we choose and penances that just come to us. And all of us have plenty of those. You know, and to accept those in love and to offer them up for other people. That is how we will grow in grace ourselves. That is how we become holy. Holiness is not necessarily going to be subjectively noticing, you know, a change immediately. Well, I offered up that traffic this morning, so why am I not holy now? You know, it takes time for this to happen. But if you look back, if you start to live like this, you'll start noticing, wow, I have changed. Grace is much clearer in hindsight. How God has helped us to grow is much clearer in hindsight. My spiritual director, when I was in the seminary and still now, at the new year, always asks me to sort of do a review of the year and to sort of look back and like notice how you've grown. That's a helpful thing because so often as we're in the daily grind, we don't always notice how we're changing, our hearts are changing. But in retrospect, if we're living in God's grace, if we're praying, if we're offering things up, the graces will come. We will be, we are meriting. We trust, it's by faith, that we are meriting an increase of grace for ourselves and for others, and to trust in this. And one last thing, especially share this with other people, especially with those who are sick, because those who are in the hospital, our hospitals can be, you know, again, sort of spiritual powerhouses, the engine rooms of the church, even in a certain way, because there's a lot of suffering in hospitals. And to invite those people who, because of sickness and, you know, the ailments that they have, to not see them as meaningless. You know, our world is so often saying that, you know, let's give them death with dignity, you know, let's, let's, you know, give them a break. But no, there's there's a power that can be there. If we invite them to unite their sufferings to Jesus, if we unite them, ask them, you know, with the grace that they have, to offer it up and to, to give it over to do this. All of this is meant to be a gift. None of this is meant to be, you better do this because otherwise you're going to go to hell. It's not based on fear that our faith is, you know, what Mary said, you know, showing them hell wasn't meant just to scare them, but it's meant to, to motivate them in a good way, to say that I can do something to help this. And so to be motivated not by fear, but by love. 
That is the goal. And to offer all things out of love to God, knowing that He sees us all the time. And He's not just there you know, ticking off all our failings, but He's there loving us. And He's so happy. He, there's so much joy in heaven. Again, like those flowers placed at the, at the altar of God. When, we, when God looks down and He sees us you know, in our own little way, praying, even if it's not a perfect prayer doing penance, even if it's maybe not perfectly, patiently accepted, you know, but little by little, God is so pleased, and this is the way that we help ourselves to become holy, how we ourselves can live out our call to be saints, and how we can help be cooperators with Jesus and with Mary, and saving the world, and bringing about the extension and the growth of the church, and the extension of the kingdom of God. Only in heaven will we see all the good that our prayers and penances do. All of these things that maybe we'll never see the repercussions, but it does so much good. And what a great and beautiful thing to imagine all of the people who's, who through our prayers, through our penances, people we don't even know, that they will have been saved even through us, not on our own, but as cooperators with Jesus and Mary. And so let us faithfully seek to live this out each day to grow ourselves in grace, and to pray, and do penance as Our Lady asked, and as Jesus himself showed us in his own life for the salvation of the world. Let's pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Lord be with you. And the Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So like I said, there are two holy cards in the back. There should be enough for all of you. So feel free to take one. Don't take two so that everybody gets one first at least. Then you can double back. If there are any left, you can take them. I think we're going to... Yes, Tina. Wonderful. So if anyone didn't hear that, it's John Paul II's birthday today. So we should pray to him that you know, he merited a lot of graces for himself and the rest of the world. So we should pray for his intercession to help us to grow as well. All right, does anybody else have questions? That it's, today is John Paul II's birthday. No, that's it. That's what I said. Yes. Right. Exactly. No, I, that line from the preface, which is really a quote from Augustine, is that in crowning our merits, you crown your own gifts. That it really is, you know, it's sort of like my mother's here. She used to, we used to have this thing at my home parish called, uh, what was it, like uh, Santa's, like the uh, place where you go and buy presents. Santa Secret Shop. So growing up, we'd go to Santa Secret Shop, and they would give me money, and I would go buy junk, and I would give it to them, you know, but they, all, but they always acted happy to receive it. On a certain level, I feel like that's kind of the dynamics of a prayer, is that it's, you know, God gives us, as it were, the principle, the grace to do these things, but then he's pleased because he, we're his children. He loves us, you know, and so that he's pleased, you know, again, yeah, it's, he doesn't need it. God doesn't need us, but he wants us. He loves us, and he wants the gifts that we give back to him. So, and that's my favorite analogy here. That's how I make sense of it in my own mind. Any other questions? No? All right. Well, if you want to go, you can stay here, pray if you want, or you can go down to the reception down the hall.